I'm going to go through the external exams from last year, the very first ATAR exams. The multiple choice questions are the first ones I'm going to do. Now, on the QCA website, obviously, these papers are there and the solutions are there as well. However, sometimes solutions on their own are not enough. They don't perhaps give you the explanations as, as clearly as they should. And I thought it might help you if I go through the multiple choice questions uh, and the papers one and two eventually and talk out loud as to how to approach and solve these questions. So question one, partly filled water bottle is sealed and left on a bench in a room at a constant temperature. After several minutes, it's noted the water level remains constant. In the water bottle, the rate of evaporation is. Now, obviously the water in the bottle is going to evaporate, but since the bottle is sealed, then the water vapor can't escape. The water vapor will recondense back to water liquid, and eventually the rate of evaporation and the rate of condensation will become the same. We have then, of course, reached what we call chemical equilibrium. Now, please realize that, I mean, A and B are clearly not options, okay? Because the rates of the condensation and evaporation would be the same. But C and D both say equal to the rate of condensation. However, chemical equilibria are dynamic processes. They're still going on. They still have rates. So therefore, it's not equal to zero. The rate of evaporation is equal to the rate of condensation, but not equal to zero. Question two, what we have here is a displacement reaction where a more reactive metal, magnesium, is basically taking the place of a less reactive metal, silver, in a displacement, single displacement reaction. You will see that magnesium has become magnesium two plus, meaning it's lost electrons. Electron loss is oxidation, and therefore magnesium has been oxidized. That, of course, makes magnesium the reducing agent. Silver ions have gained electrons to become silver metal. Therefore, they have been reduced, making silver ions the oxidizing agent. If you find it difficult to see electron being gained or lost when they're not actually showing them, work out oxidation numbers. Magnesium is zero because it's an element and they haven't yet done anything. They haven't gained or lost electrons. Uh, on the right-hand side, it's lost two electrons. It's become a plus two. An increase in oxidation number is oxidation. Same reasoning, Ag plus is plus one. Ag is zero. A decrease in oxidation number is reduction. So this is your choice. Magnesium ions, sorry, magnesium atoms are oxidized and act as a reducing agent. What we have in question three is an addition polymerization. We are ta taking an alkene. We are breaking the double bond to allow bonds to form either side, and that will then end up as a single bond. So this will simply repeat itself over and over again. There will be no other product, which of course is a feature of addition, polymerization. Olive of wintergreen is a chemical compound with the following structure, identify the functional groups. Now, unfortunately, they have asked for the functional groups and they haven't given you the OH group because OH is called hydroxyl and the class that it belongs to is an alcohol. Now, hydroxyl doesn't appear there. This is incorrect. It should say class, not functional group. I'll show you in the syllabus where it identifies the difference. It says the distinction between class and functional group should be made. For example, for OH, hydroxyl is the functional group, whereas alcohol is the class. Clearly, even though they think you should know the difference, they don't seem to worry too much about it when they ask you questions. So clearly, it's got to be A, all right? There's your alcohol, and there is your ester. But the reality is these are classes, not functional groups. But it's got to be A. There is no other option. Question five, we have four equilibrium constants given for four equilibrium reactions. Now, it asks in which reaction is the equilibrium furthest to the left? 
let's remind ourselves that a K value measures product concentrations over reactant concentrations. So the bigger the K is, the more product is present and the further it is to the right. If we want the equilibrium that lies furthest to the left, then we want the smallest K value. So that favors reactants and means there's very little product present. So the smallest value there is B, 3 times 10 to the minus 8. Question 6. Calculate the cell potential produced by a zinc, zinc ion, copper ion, copper, galvanic cell, and the standard conditions. When they write the cell diagram like this, you literally take it in order, meaning that zinc is turning into zinc ions and copper ions are turning into copper. The double line in the middle there represents the distinction between the two, in other words, the salt bridge. For this, you will need to go to your standard electropotentials chart, which I have here. You will see that zinc ions becoming zinc is minus 0.76, and copper ions becoming copper is plus 0.34. Now, there are two ways you can do this. You can either use what I feel is the easier option, and I call it the anti-clockwise rule. I don't know if that's a general thing or it's something I made up. However, anti-clockwise means that the above reaction goes backwards and the below reaction goes forwards. So it's an anti-clockwise direction. When you do that, then of course, the minus 0.76 for the forward reaction will become plus 0.76. Add that to the plus 0.34 of the copper half cell, and the overall voltage is 1.1 volt, which is choice D. Now, there is another way of doing it, and that is to use a little formula. There's a formula which says EMF is the standard electropotential of the right-hand half cell minus the standard electropotential of the left-hand half cell. So doing that, that would be plus 0.34 minus minus 0.76. The two minuses make a plus, and again, you end up with 1.1 volt. So if you like using that formula, the minus changes the sign for you. Using the anti-clockwise rule, you change the sign yourself. Okay. If this had been written the other way around, with copper there and copper ions there, and zinc ions there, and zinc metal there, then the answer would have been minus 1.1 volt. Just making sure you understand. And that minus, of course, tells you you've done it the wrong way around. Okay? A minus sign means it won't happen. A plus sign means it will. Question seven. We have four acids. We've given their concentrations in moles per liter, and we've given their pHs as numbers. Analyze the data to determine the relative strength of the acids from strongest to weakest. Well, immediately, clearly, pH is a good guide as to the strength of an acid. The lower the pH number, the stronger the acid is. Unfortunately, they have given us different concentrations there, but they're not that different. So, for example, the 5 and the 2.8, we can rule those out straight away. But if we were to look at 1 and 1.9, this is 2 times 10 to the minus 2. This is 9 times 10 to the minus 2. That, that means that this is 4.5 times more concentrated than that. However, this loses 2 H pluses. This loses 3. So that would obviously reduce the difference again. The difference between the pH of 1.9 and 1 is almost 10 times different. Remember, it's a log scale. In other words, H2SO4 is the strongest acid, followed by H3PO4 followed by CH3COOH, and finally HCN, which is choice B. Question 8. An organic compound X reacts to sodium hydrogen carbonate to form carbon dioxide gas. Compound X is. Now, this reaction here is not in Unit 3 or 4. Unit 4 obviously deals with organic compounds, and this reaction is not mentioned in the syllabus. However, in unit one and two, units one and two, one of the things you have to learn about are basic reactions of acids. And acids react with carbonates and hydrogen carbonates to form salts, water, and carbon dioxide. Now, K 
can they ask you a question from unit one and two? They will tell you they can because it's regarded as basic stuff. I don't think I would ever advise you to go and learn unit one and two again, as well as three and four. There's plenty to learn in three and four. You do not want to be burdening yourself anymore. If they should ask the occasional question, it'll be worth maybe one mark. And it's certainly not worth the effort of going through the whole of units one and two for that one mark. However, saying that, I would definitely remember that acids and carbonates or hydrogen carbonates make carbon dioxide. And therefore, a carboxylic acid is your choice here. Okay. The only thing you need to know about carboxylic acids is they react with bases to form salts and they react with alcohols to form esters. But I would definitely keep this one in my back pocket as well. It could be asked again. Question nine, phosgene is formed for the, in the following reaction. You will see that there's two moles of gas on the left, one mole of gas on the right, and the delta H is a negative, meaning the forward reaction is exothermic. So which of these is true? Removing chlorine will increase the yield of phosgene. Well, if I remove chlorine, Le Chatelier tells me the system will shift to the left to return it, and therefore that isn't gonna work, okay? Adding a catalyst will increase the yield of phosgene. Catalyst will speed up the rate of getting to equilibrium, but they don't affect the position of equilibrium. So B is incorrect. Increasing the pressure will increase the yield of phosgene and keep Kc constant. Increasing the pressure, Le Chatelier says, will be opposed by the system trying to decrease the pressure, which it can do by moving in the forward direction because two moles of gas exert twice the pressure of one mole of gas. So by moving to the right, you will oppose the increase in pressure. Changing pressure will not change the value of K, and therefore C is the correct answer. Just looking at D to make sure, decreasing the temperature will decrease the yield of phosgene. Decreasing the temperature would favor the exothermic reaction. In other words, to reheat the thing up, to increase the temperature. So again, that is wrong. It won't decrease the yield of phosgene. Also, changing the temperature will change the value of K as well. So C is your correct answer. Question 10. Hopefully you will recognize immediately that this is an electrolytic cell. It says here, which of the following is true for the electrochemical cell? Electrochemical could be electrolytic or it could be galvanic. If it's a galvanic, there'll be two separate containers. There will also be no power, power source because galvanic cells are spontaneous. Electrolytic cells are not spontaneous. They require power to force reactions against their will, if you like. So we can immediately rule out A and B because they're both spontaneous and this is a non-spontaneous process. So C and D is down to one of those. And again, if you eliminate two, even if you don't know the right answer from the remaining two, you've got a 50-50 chance of guessing. And again, they don't know when they mark in it if it's guessed or known. So please don't leave a multiple choice question ever blank. If you don't know it, if you haven't got a clue, you've still got a one in four chance, guess it. Anyway, coming back to this. So uh, the anode, it says, is the negative electrode for choice C and oxidation for choice D. Right, okay, well, in an electrolytic cell, the anode, in fact, is the positive electrode. In a galvanic cell, it's the negative electrode. But as you know, of course, that changes when you go from one to the other. So what doesn't change is the fact that oxidation always takes place at the anode. So D is your correct choice, and the electrons flow from the negative terminal through the wire to the negative electrode, which is, of course, the cathode, which is the negative electrode. So 10 is D. Now I'm gonna stop there, and the next video will deal with questions 11 to 20.